So, uh, so thank you, uh, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, I, uh, this is a topic that I really like and that I always like to uh, talk about. It's uh, something that I've been doing for some years now. It's about uh, how to secure positioning. So um, I, I'm really super excited about anything that relates to the physical world. So how do we, how do we secure any kind of measurements that, um, that can determine, for example, where we are or even any other sensing modalities, right? And so why do I care about this? Well, I care about this because obviously this motivation slide will, it will not surprise anyone, but, but in all these examples that you see here, um, somehow location or distance information plays a role. So, and these are all more or less critical systems, depends on how, how much you believe that your pacemaker is a critical system, right? So, for example, in a, in a scenario here where you have a cars moving around, and if they are self-driving cars, you, you might want to know where they are, or they might know, want to know securely where they are, and also they might want to know their distance securely. In cases like, um, like flying drones, you would also like the drones to know their mutual distances securely and to coordinate their, their flight. In case of access to cars, I will give this example. Um, actually, there are systems today where you approach a car and the car will unlock if, if you're close to the car. So this immediately essentially shows you that the notion of proximity or distance is, is linked to the notion to security, right? So because you derive security notions from, from uh, distance information. And there are many other examples, right? For example, I could say, well, whoever is in this room gets access to Wi-Fi or gets access to some sensitive data. And this would be a really cool feature because somehow physical access control is very, very natural to, to all of us. You could define policies like if someone enters my house, they can see a set of pictures of, that I took from my vacations, right? So, um, so why is this? <clears throat> so what are the basic kind of security properties that you want out of a positioning system. So what you want is primarily spoofing resilience. So this is a case of, of GPS, right? Where you, where you want to have uh, your own device, so a device that wants to determine its own location, determine actually a correct location in the presence of an adversary that's trying to influence this location. However, you can have other scenarios. Like I want to, for example, know where my kids are. I want to know this securely because they might not want to tell me where they are, right? So, and I'm, I'm, I might want to verify their location. So this can also apply to, to your other relatives or to, to work partners, or you might want to know that someone is connecting from a particular location and not from, a, from some location that you, don't, that you don't like. But then there are issues like location and identity privacy, and I'm not going to cover those in this talk because the, um, because it's a very, very difficult problem and we are not solving it. And uh, I'm not even sure that there is a good solution to that problem. So what about GPS? Because that's the first thing that comes to people's minds. Well, GPS, at least civilian GPS is not really, not really secure. So what are the issues with, with civilian GPS? Well, you will see these research reports saying that you know, GPS can be spoofed, that Iran managed to inject wireless signals uh, and essentially mislead a US drone to land in, a, in an Iranian uh, US air base while, uh, in an Iranian air base while the drone believed that it was flying to a US, US base, right? Now, uh, also some researchers from University of Texas also performed this kind of uh, spoofing hacks uh, on, a, on a US drone with the permission of the US, US Air Force. So how can you do these kind of attacks? Well, it's actually not really difficult. So you take uh, these kind of devices that you see at the, at the bottom of the slide that are called GPS signal generators. These are essentially test equipment. This is essentially test equipment, which is able to generate wireless signals that correspond to the signals that the GPS satellite would, would generate, right? And now, if you are creative enough, now you can generate such signals that, that even if, uh, if, uh, if, even if you're GPS receiver receives legitimate GPS signals, you would still be able to shift a, a computed location to, uh, to somewhere else. So is this really feasible? How does this work? So here's the, uh, 
a little bit of James Bond uh, background uh, just for your entertainment, but this video shows you how, how this can be done. So this is a relatively simple example where we took a mobile phone and, um, and we, um, we essentially initially first uh, calculated the location of this mobile phone um, where, it, where it actually is. And then we started, we started spoofing. Yeah. And now the location actually shifted, right? As you, as you see, right? We can shift the location to, uh, to any arbitrary place on the planet. So you can see that we are now moving it um, at pretty high speeds. And now the next location that we that we are going to um, to get will be in uh, Berlin. And obviously the device didn't teleport itself to Berlin. So why does this work? Well, this works because if you if you think of a GPS receiver, it's essentially a receiver that's waiting for the outside information. It's a receiver, right? So it doesn't really transmit information. It's it wa it's waiting for others to tell him where he is. So it's like me closing my eyes and just listening to, to all of you telling me where I am, right? And how is the location calculated? Well, it's essentially, you can, you can think, about, think about it in the following way. So the satellites are transmitting their signals simultaneously, right, at the same time. And what the receiver is, is, is calculating is essentially a, a difference in the arrival times between different signals from the satellites, right? And based on these differences in the arrival times, it calculates its own, its own location, and not only its own location, but also time. Because your, the clock of your receiver is not synchronized with the clocks of the satellites, and in order to compensate for that, we need at least four signals, and then the receiver is going to calculate its own clock offset to the, to the satellites, which have atomic clocks, and, and therefore determine not only its location in three dimensions, but also also the time, which is also fairly important because in a, in a lot of critical systems like power grids and so forth, you're using GPS receivers in order to determine time, to close control loops. So if you would now spoof the time of these kind of systems, you could throw power grids out of, out of control and people have already shown that this can be done. So, so how do you spoof? Well, you can either modify the navigation signal message content uh, because these uh, navigation uh, messages, they actually carry some content, and or you can, you can uh, manipulate the time of arrival. So this content, for example, can be where the satellites are. So obviously if you shift that, then you can shift uh, the calculated location. Or you can manipulate the time of arrival, which is much more interesting, because unlike, unlike the content, which we know how to protect in security by digital signatures, time of arrival we can't protect by digital signatures, because I don't care which kind of message this, which kind of bits the message carries, but I care about the time of arrival. Now, if this is shifted, you have no, mechan no cryptographic mechanism to detect this time shift, okay? There's actually nothing that cryptography can do to help you to prevent this kind of a time delay, okay? So civilian GPS is not authenticated and can be generated or delayed, but military GPS can only be delayed because they are actually authenticated through secret spreading codes. And uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll leave that for a more detailed discussion in case you're interested. Uh, just to kind of inform you of the balance of, uh, of the use of military and civilian GPS, uh, military GPS systems, they rely on pre-shared keys with all the receivers because otherwise spreading cannot be done. And you can imagine what kind of a secret that is if you have to share it with many receivers. And uh, so these kind of systems typically don't scale and they're very hard to, to deploy. And that's why in, in, a in, in a large percentage of military operations, civilian GPS is being used as well. And I, I would suspect that this is what happened with this Iranian drone as well. So how would you go about detecting GPS spoofing, right? Okay. So you can try to change GPS. So in, in, in some sense, you can try to say, well, I'm going to put some authentication on top of navigation messages, but this is not going to really help you because digital signatures in messages will just equally be delayed. 
You can also use secret spreading codes, which require shared, shared secrets, and also that's not a perfect protection. You, you need to have a fair amount of environmental noise in order to hide, and someone who has good antennas can still dig these signals out. There are some ideas about delayed key disclosure that's more for people who are in the area, right? That might, might hit a good compromise between these two, but are still um, vulnerable to some types of attacks. Or what you can do, you can, whoops, you can try to, what you can try to do, you can try to look at the navigation signals that you receive, and you can try to detect that there is a spoofing by, by seeing, for example, that there are too many navigation signals around, or that the noise level increased, or that the, um, or for example, that the number of satellites that, that are observed is unexpected for that location. Or you can look into autocorrelation peak dis uh, distortions, spatial diversity in terms of where are these signals coming from. So for example, if you detect that the signal is not coming from up in the sky, but that it's coming from some ground station or the direction of a ground station, you can try to detect this. So these are all, all kind of techniques that you can use in order to, to detect that something is off with the signals that you receive. There are a lot of, when you put this all in a, in a box with some machine learning, there are a lot of false positives and false negatives that can, that can hit you there. So your GPS receiver might go up, up and down in terms of uh, signaling that there might be a spoofing attack. My point here is not to go over all these in detail, but just to give you an overview, right? I'll just, I, I, I wanna show you one, one particular attack, which we call a seamless takeover attack, because I think it's, it's kind of, it illustrates how tricky these things can be and how um, subtle they can be. So here you see a ship in the middle of the, of the ocean and it's receiving satellite signals from, uh, from legitimate satellites. And here's an adversary who, who will inject its own, his own signals. So the, the adversary at first can, can transmit at a very low power, right? And he can transmit such that his signals are actually perfectly aligned with the signals from the satellites. This means that when you calculate what is called an, what, what is an autocorrelation peak, which detects, detects essentially when the signals are arriving, um, then the signal of the, of the attacker will be perfectly aligned with the signal of the, of, the, of the legitimate satellite. Now, what does the attacker then do? Well, then the attacker will now increase the power of his, of his own signal. And now the, the peaks will kind of flip, right? Now the, the stronger peak will be, will be of the attacker and the, and the weaker peak will be of the, of the legitimate uh, satellites. And they're still perfectly aligned. Your location still didn't really change. And now in the third step, the adversary starts shifting a stronger peak away, I mean shifting his own peak away from, from where you should be, meaning the attacker is now changing slowly your location. What will your receiver do? Well, it will start tracking the stronger peak because that's how the receivers are built. And they will track a stronger peak and they will tr ignore a weaker peak because they will believe that that's a product of a multipath effect or of, of some randomness in the environment, okay? And now this kind of a seamless takeover attack is just one example of, of how things can go wrong, right? And it's super subtle, right? Because it, it essentially, it essentially eliminates the, the detection of, of, uh, of signals which are injected by the, by the adversary. There are many other things that you can do here. For example, you could be looking at the distortion of the autocorrelation peak because here the autocorrelation peak is, is plotted in this perfect, with this perfect shape, but it's not going to have this perfect shape when you, uh, when you are in a, in, a, in a real environment. So in order to, to kind of put all these things together and put many techniques together and to to, to try to detect that spoofing is actually happening, what we have, uh, what we have done is we, we started a, a small community project, an open source GPS uh, receiver, uh, which detects pretty much up to an accuracy all known, all known attacks. Uh, so what we have we done? We took, a <coughs> we took essentially an existing open source G GNSS platform and we modified the, the acquisition phase of the signal and the tracking phase with uh, some auxiliary peak tracking plus some, some detection and navigation message inspector to check for all kinds of consistency. 
And therefore, we, we strengthen this receiver with the detection module for, again, spoofing, right? We, we put in, essentially, a lot of techniques that, that were out there and that we came up with as well in order to build this, to build this system. Now, I'm not going to go over this, but just to give you an idea that this uh, attack that we, that we have, um, uh, that, that I just presented, would also be detected using this, using our, our techniques. So we would track, for example, all the peaks and then do some magic there to detect spoofing. It's open source. You can download it and use it. You can download the, the code. You can modify it. You can play with it. You can enhance it. You can do better results than we have achieved. Uh, we are still working on it, but it's really something that I, I, I believe in. What did we do in order to test our system? Well, essentially, we, we took, we generated our own GPS signals using GPS uh, signal simulate, uh, generators, the devices that you have seen. We also took some independent data. So there is a University of Texas spoofing battery, um, which has, they have a lot of data of uh, different signals with spoofing, without spoofing, and so on. So we put those in as well. We did war driving around Zurich and uh, around the Swiss countryside in order to collect GPS signals. And here, when I say we, you know, the people who actually drove these cars and, and, um, and, um, and collect, connected these USRPs and laptops were obviously my students who spent, you know, hours and hours of work doing this, so I cannot take all the credit, right? Um, and then what, did, what we did, we, we, we fed all these into our, into our system, and essentially we could detect all spoofing attacks that are aiming at shifting your device more than one kilometer away from its its uh, current location. And now we are working on getting this even even tighter, right? Essentially, if you think about it conceptually, this means that the peak, peak separation for this kind of a result uh, can be clearly distinguished from multipath. Okay, so this is essentially one kind of uh, a project where we are looking at how to detect spoofing using a single de GPS device. However, we don't have to use a single GPS device to detect spoofing. We can leverage many uh, several GPS devices as long as we know their mutual dist as, as long as these devices know their mutual distance. So here's a very high level idea. So imagine that you have a ship or a, or a plane or a drone where you placed GPS receivers at, at different locations on, a, on the ship or a, or a drone. And of course, these devices know that they are, let's say, 10, 20, 50 meters apart, because you, you put them there, and presumably no one, no one moved them. So what happens if, if, uh, if this spoofer here generates signals and tries to spoof these devices? Well, if you think about it a little bit, you will, you will conclude that all the devices that receive the signals from the spoofer will essentially compute the same location. Now, why would they compute the same location? Well, because the devices are measuring the shifts, so the differences in the arrival times from the signals generated by the spoofer, and therefore, all these differences will be preserved because all the signals are traveling at the same speed of, speed of light, and therefore, will resolve the same location. Now, this is great for us because we can therefore detect spoofing because these devices, if these devices here all calculate the same location, then that means that spoofing is happening because they shouldn't. They simply shouldn't. They are 10 plus meters apart. Okay, so this works up to a certain accuracy, right? But I think you can intuitively understand how powerful this is because this, this means that now we, are, we suddenly have an upper hand against an adversary, right? As long as, you know, as long as the adversary cannot selectively transmit signals into each of the, each of the devices. So now you can, you know, you can go a little bit academic and define uh, this as a more general problem, a group spoofing problem, where an adversary has to solve 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 this um, this this problem, right? And his problem would be how to place his spoofers. So now he can have mo multiple spoofers, and how can he uh, generate signals such that he shifts an entire set of receivers in a certain formation to a to, to an entirely new location or any combination of this, right? Okay. So to give you an idea of some of the results, 
So what you can also now show is that if you have two receivers, what you are essentially doing, you're forcing each of the spoofers to sit on either a hy hyperbole or a set of hyperboloids or some intersections of these. So this means that as you increase the number of receivers that, that are in a particular formation, the problem for the attacker becomes more and more constrained. So the set of locations from which he can spoof becomes smaller and smaller, and eventually, after five receivers, you force the attacker to sit at the satellites in the sky in order to spoof. And then obviously that's game over, right? Because that's, if the adversary can really ride on the satellites, then, then the, uh, the game is over. But that actually also shows that the technique is powerful because that you assume that he cannot do. So, yes, you know, GPS spoofing can be prevented in a number of scenarios. However, if you really co collapse this into a, into a degenerate case of me being an attacker, putting a phone into a Faraday cage and feeding it signals, there is no way to detect spoofing. No way. Because I can always generate an environment for this phone that essentially corresponds to another location because there's no detection mechanism that can work in that in that case right nothing works right this is a you know this would be a you know dolevial attacker he can kill all the signals he can inject whatever he wants nothing works right so and this can be proven right relatively easily that broadcast systems like gps cannot fully secure against against um, spoofing if the attacker controls fully the environment around the device. If the device for example, is, for example, mobile and moving around and the attacker now has to move somewhere, then you can do something and detect spoofing. Otherwise, in this kind of environment, if I want to cheat on a GPS receiver in my own car, no, no help. Okay. So I could show that secure positioning requires either bidirectional communication or requires communication from the device to the infrastructure, but not from the infrastructure to the device, like we have in GPS. So either these two cases work, but the one that we have of GPS actually cannot, cannot provide security. However, it's a fantastic system because it provides global coverage, right? So not requiring uh, bidirectional communication actually has its, its purpose, right? People who build it were not, uh, went for broad functionality, not, not necessarily for security. So <clears throat> if we now go back to Earth where we can actually do bidirectional communication and put it in a context of, um, let's say, the, fans, the, the fashionable world, world, world of uh, IoT devices, then we can do secure positioning with 100% uh, guarantee and we can prevent any type of an attack. Okay, but we, we then have to use bidirectional communication. So why is IoT kind of, um, positioning important well I don't have to convince you right all of these devices you you want to you approach your car the car will unlock you approach your your laptop the the laptop should unlock you approach your door the door should unlock you shouldn't be able you shouldn't be forced to press any buttons to touch any any sensor or whatever everything should just open for you because that's what you want right we are lazy creatures right and we want things just to work, right? And the more you give us, the less we want to work. So, um, so I think this is um, I think this is really uh, key, and it will be interesting in the future as well, right? Where um, you know, also drones when they fly around, they might want to measure their, their distances and therefore coordinate. So, I guess I I already pretty much said this, but you know, to payment for payments for preparing for uh, you know all kinds of applications i think this is this is the um, this is super important so this is really intuitive non interactive approach to authorizing access to physical spaces or to data or to anything else as i mentioned this this uh, scenario before you know you you want when you enter a certain space to be granted access to data right I think physical access control works pretty well today, right? 
So we, we, we can sort of keep people outside of spaces if we want to, right? And this is always the, the, the bottom line of defense, right? You put a guard there. If you are not comfortable with only a guard, you give him a gun. If not, you put two guards with a gun and then you escalate further, right? So here's an example where this actually really mattered. So it's an attack that we did a while back. It's called, um, so the system that we attacked is called the passive keyless entry and start system, which is used to unlock cars. So these are the, the systems that you have most probably in most, uh, in most models, car models today. You keep your key in the pocket. When you approach the car, the car will unlock for you. When you sit in the car, you, a little green button will, will light up and you can press a button and the car will start, right? Everyone loves it. You don't need to find your, car, your keys and, and everything is good, right? But how does the car know that you are close to the car? How does the car know that you are in the car in order to, to allow you access? Well, well, it measures a distance in some sense, right? It has to securely measure this distance. Imagine what would happen if someone would be able to, to trick the car into believing that the key is closer, that it's actually close, and then, and then uh, open the car and then start the car and drive away. So we didn't only imagine that, we actually did it. So this is a, a protocol that runs in most cars. Uh, some use a slightly different frequency here, but roughly, you know, there is an LF challenge that goes from the from the car to the key, uh, to the sorry, from the car to the key, yeah, and which excites the key, and the key will then reply with an authentic reply. We didn't look into the crypto. We didn't look into this challenge response phase. We didn't change anything in the messages. A very simple thing that we did is we simply relayed these messages between the car and the key. That's all. And the car, my car back then, magically unlocked, right? As I was 60 meters away. So first we pulled the cable. You know, we literally, I mean, this is the antenna that we use. So we literally, you know, made a coil antenna in the, in the lab and, and had a slightly larger antenna for the, to excite the key from, from, let's say, two meters distance. So I could, I could literally be now blasting the signals here into this room and relaying them to the parking lot and opening your cars, right? That's what one could do. But of course, you know, it's really uncomfortable to drag these cables behind you to perform this attack, so we made it wireless. Uh, of course, it was widely reported, you know, newspapers like this, people like this because, you know, cars are something that people are super um, keen on and they can easily understand. Uh, recently also, um, ADAC repeated this, uh, this experiment. We did this in 2011, and they, they essentially went back and they said, hey, what about this attack? You know, does it still work? And uh, surprise, surprise, you know, in 2016, um, this attack still opens uh, essentially all car, cars out there on the market. Does this happen in practice? Well, yes. So you see these guys that are essentially one with um, with the device here, they are, what, what are they doing? So they're essentially exciting a key which is in the house and then relaying the messages to the, to the car and then unlocking the car, starting the car and, and driving away. So the, 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 you know, you, you come home, you put your keys on the table, your car is outside. I come with a, with a colleague, I put the antenna onto the window, excite the key, relay to the car, start the car, drive away. Now you would say, well, what if the link between the key and the car is lost? Well, the car will not stop. I mean, the reason is essentially that, you know, we all have kids, you have kids in the back seat, you give them the keys, they play, they throw them out of the window, your, key sh your car should still be able to drive to a to nearby station, right? So, or to, uh, in this case, to, uh, to a disassembly shop. So essentially, you know, communication does not imply proximity in in uh, adversarial settings. This is something that, that is really, really, you know, I know it's a simple message, but somehow people didn't catch that uh, back then. And uh, I've been pounding on it ever since, right? Communication does not imply proximity in adversarial settings. So we need to actually build a secure distance measurement system. So the, how do we securely determine that the distance between the two devices, or the, how do we securely detect the proximity between two devices? It doesn't have to be a precise distance, but it needs to be 
You know, how do I know that I'm actually close to you within a certain distance, let's say within two meters, as opposed to hundreds of meters? And you know, it's, it's relatively, you know, that's what we want. And if you, if you have never done radio design or, or wireless, you would say, well, measure some time and you'll be fine, right? Which is actually super tricky to do, and in the end, the solutions go into that direction, but <coughs> that's what we have actually done, right? So we have built this um, system. I will talk about it a little bit later. So, so what do we want? What is the security property first that we want? So what we want is we want that if we have A and B, this could be the car and the key that are mutually trusted devices that have you know, keys pre-shared between them because that's what you have in a car and the key and a key fob. We want that the attacker cannot convince A and B that they are closer than they actually are. So we don't care necessarily about them being further away because that's not interesting for access control in, this ca in these cases at least. But we want, that's the minimum that we want, right? The attacker shouldn't be able to convince you that you're, clo that you're closer than you actually are. Okay, so how would you do that? So there, actually we went back, you know, when we did all these attacks and, and even, even before that we went back to the past and we said, okay, you know, did someone actually think about this? So there, are, there were uh, works in, the in, in 1993 by, by, by Browns and Chaum and they were looking actually at this, at this problem in a, in a rather wired environment, right? They wanted to, there were so-called mafia fraud attacks by which, um, Mafia would put out fake ATMs, fake, fake, you know, money machines, right? And you would in enter your card, and then you would enter your PIN, and this machine would then relay all the communication from uh, to the real ATM, and obviously would have your PIN. And then the money would come out of the real ATM. Obviously, the attacker would get it, and you would get an error message saying, "Well, we are out of money. You know, go somewhere else." So it's a simple relay, right? I mean, because you, you would need to kind of recognize, so your card should recognize that it's close to the real ATM, right? As opposed to being in a fake ATM, right? So they started thinking, okay, how, we could, how could we do that? So they proposed some protocols, uh, initially called distance bounding protocols, and ever since we, we actually said, let's take that, that name. It's actually a pretty fitting name. And let's try to use these protocols. We, we couldn't actually use these protocols because they were built for wired communication and uh, there was no actually wireless system that could support this. And here's the reason why. Well, because if you try to build a secure distance measurement system, what, what would you initially say? You would say, okay, I need authentication and I need distance measurement. I will put them together and then this should be fine. So we tried, you know, so you can say, I'm going to indirectly measure distance by observing receive signal strength by observing phase. This is a multi-carrier measurement system from Atmel. We'll do it by uh, frequency, by FMCW, right? Uh, those are another types of other types of systems. Or we can directly measure the distance by using chirp spread spectrum, um, by using essentially chirps, which are a special type of modulation that covers a wider spectrum. Uh, or we can use ultra-wideband, uh, there is already an ultra wideband standard for distance measurement. So we said, okay, you can just take authentication, put that on top of these distance measurement systems, and then we are done. Well, guess what? Uh, none of these work, right? Because the, so they're all broken on, on, on many different levels, and it will probably take me a quite a bit of time to explain why, but I'll give you, I'll give you a hint at one of the of one of the systems, but you can essentially count that all in red are bro broken. I can, I can say, I can sort of firmly claim that none of the indirect distance measurement systems are, are, are secure, and that only direct distance measurement systems based on time of flight can actually be secured. Um, of course, if you consider like a Dolev Yao attack, right? If you weaken your attacker, then you can do something, maybe. So, so even standards, you know, are not really fitting for this purpose, which is okay. They, they have not been built for this purpose. They have been built for distance measurement, not for secure distance measurement. So why are these broken? Well, because the attacks that we actually showed are not the attacks on the logical layer, they are, the, they are attacks on the physical layer, right? So this is one of the simplest attacks. You know, you, 
you transmit a signal and based on the received signal strength you you measure the distance well obviously the attacker can put an amplifier amplify the signal and reduce the distance so this doesn't work phase ranging um, actually you can play with the shifts in phases to take more more time to explain but it's a similar principle uh, you can roll over some phases you can do many things so this is what we did recently we broke one of the atmel systems by uh, that that was based on phase ranging and show that it can be we can shorten distances arbitrarily practically but let me uh, show you one attack maybe that that shows you the complexity of this or let us say what what are all the things that one has to consider so it's called the ear early detect plus late commit attack and it was so uh, these guys from uh, back then in Cambridge uh, came up with it so it's an attack where you know your your ones and zeros are really not are encoded in wireless signals right and they're encoded essentially as sequences of either sine waves or, or some particular modulation right some shapes the symbols have certain shapes right so let's assume that this is a symbol for one and this is a symbol for zero uh, what can the attacker do in this in this context well the attacker what the attacker can do he can actually start so before the key uh, so th this is now a challenge a challenge uh, so this is now a signal that goes that goes from the key to the car right so before the, the 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 key actually starts sending a signal to the to the car the attacker can start sig sending some gibberish to the to the car and then when the when the attacker figures out which bit the the car, the, the key actually wanted to send the attacker can continue with the correctly correctly shaped symbol now when the when the car at the end does the autocorrelation and tries to figure out which symbol it received it's actually going to detect a one but it's going to detect a one with the time shift with a, with an earlier time than sent by the by the key i know that this uh, sounds a little bit counterintuitive but you have to understand that the symbols have certain shapes and certain certain length in order to to allow for uh for channel properties to be to be taken into account because your you will never so these signals will never look like this right they will always be somehow distorted so actually detecting these kind of attacks might seem easy on this on this uh, uh, figure but it's actually not right you cannot easily detect this and we have shown this for many many practical systems so we show this for example for chirp chirp signals that this is easily done uh, I'll probably skip this another kind of attack uh, on time of arrival estimation which was done at EPFL and it, it was done on 802.11 um, ultra wideband ranging standard right it's called the Chicada attack so you know secure distance measurement actually needs to be based on direct time of flight and requires specialized specialized physical layer design and so we actually did that you know we we, we prevented relay attacks by short ultra wideband symbols where these kind of early detect late commit attacks cannot be done where chicada attacks are are not feasible we have a special modulation and time of flight scheme we implement distance bounding protocols on top of it we have some fancy stuff like distance commitment which would take me probably a lot a, lo a lot of time to explain now so i'll skip it and now when we put all of this together we have um, a system that has these kind of characteristics and one of my one of my students back then a couple of years ago actually decided to start a company on this and uh, now after after some years we have uh, we have a we have a chip so this is this, this is a chip with the antenna here right which uh, gives you round secure distance measurement with round trip time of flight these are the specifications right very low power consumption and and uh, the the company will um, is deploying this now in the in the new cars so you will see this chip in the in the new in your new cars so um, of course if it's our chip it's going to be secure if it's someone else's chip I, I don't know no. so. so this is just to give you an idea right the chip is very small this is a development board so um, this is just to give you an idea of how this this really works in practice so you can move around and get your this is a distance in meters uh, that's calculated on the fly so we we can really do it in real time because the 
single measurement takes one millisecond, so you can literally do it in real time. Right? Now, why am I excited about this? Well, because, um, well, if you can do, if you can prevent someone from reducing the distance between two devices, then you can actually enable secure positioning in a space. How can you do that? Well, there is a very simple argument, right? If you have infrastructure nodes, like these nodes here, that um, like V1, V2, and V3, this could be like your satellites, you know, your, your, uh, the nodes that know their positions and they are, they are mutually trusted. And now P wants to calculate its own location, right? Now, um, if an adversary tries to shorten the distance, he will be prevented by our system. Right? So he cannot shorten the measured distance between P and any of these any of these devices. So the only thing that he can do, he can try to enlarge this distance. Now, what will happen if he tries to enlarge this, this distance? Well, if he tries to enlarge D1, for example, he would need to reduce the size of D2 or, D, or D3 in order to make this new position consistent with these distance. And he cannot, because we, we can prevent distance shortening. So we essentially have a system for secure positioning that works within this triangle. Right, and we don't really care if the if the adversary shifts you here because, well, this is the space that our secure positioning infrastructure covers. Right, so you know that if you if you calculate your location, let's say within the TU Vienna space, it's it's a secure position that you obtain. If your position is suddenly somewhere else, you don't care. You you cannot say anything about its security. Right, it might be fine, but you don't know if it's secure or not. So you have this very, very nice secure positioning system that you can build on top of this. Yeah. I guess this is the repetition. And now, of course, the, uh, the vision, <laughs> the grand vision that I have is that uh, we can push this uh, further, right? That we can now build systems that can expand this to, um, to kilometers and uh, cover, you know, cover the, um, entire cities and provide secure positioning within within the cities or at least larger larger spaces and that's essentially a, a topic of um, of my um, of my research in the next years uh, generously supported by the ERC uh, council so uh, I'm super excited about this topic I mean it's really something that I'm um, I really, really like. I think it's an interesting interplay between security protocol design, radio design, physical layer properties, and there are a lot of things that one can do here, and I enjoy it. Uh, if you also enjoy it, please join us and, and do this uh, as well. Uh, I think it's going to be in incredibly important in the future for all kinds of purposes, authentication and so on. Uh, you can see all of them there, right? I don't, I don't want to throw in any more uh, buzzwords and um, I have one more if I'm do I have time a few more minutes I have one more thing to to show you because I, I find it kind of complementary and, and and exciting as well so so the surprising thing that came up because in my group we we're doing a lot of this kind of um, proximity based uh, things is that at some point, one of one of my uh, postdocs and students, they said, "Well, maybe we can use something like this for online authentication. You know, continuous online authentication. Like if you if you now approach your browser, can your browser or your s the server in a browser know that you are actually close to it, and could it could it provide you with like a seamless continuous second factor authentic uh, authentication for online online systems, right?" Of course, we know how to do it. If I put my chip into into a, into a phone or into a into a laptop, I can I can do this. But you know, can we do it within the constraints of, of existing uh, browsers and and phones? So we we thought about it and we came up with a system that I I hope you will like as well. So we wanted to build really a continuous, non-intrusive, non-interactive authentication. So the main actually question here was that. We wanted to, to say, if, you, if I approach my browser, and even without typing my, maybe I can type in my password, maybe not, 
but my second factor should be immediately engaged. I don't need to type in any pins, any compare any numbers or whatever. If my phone is close to the browser, I should log in. That's what I want. And how did we approach it? Well, we essentially went on to see, you know, how can we do this? So the phone would need to essentially detect if it's close to the laptop on which user is opening a browser, a browser session to the server, right? So, so somehow you would need this kind of um, a connection. So until, until actually recently, browsers were more sandboxed. Actually recently uh, Chrome uh, started opening up Bluetooth a little bit, but, but uh, until, until recently, you know, there was no access to the from the browser, so the script running in a browser couldn't really access Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or other interfaces, right? Because the, obviously for security reasons, right? You have untrusted code executing within a browser, it should be, it should be sandboxed. And uh, what we also didn't want, we didn't want plugins, additional browser extensions, things installed on the, on the system, right? We wanted that if you walk around the hospital as a doctor and approach any terminal, you're authenticated. You don't have to configure all this stuff. So the, the, the main design goal wasn't actually, we didn't start from the security goal. We started from usability and deployability goal, right? Which is usually a little bit, you know, a, another way around it, right? We, we said, this is our primary goal and let's see how much security we can obtain. And then we figured out, okay, but the only interface that's actually fully supported by all the browsers and the interface that's natively supported on the phones is actually the microphone and the, and the speakers. And so this, this, this is where we fo focused our attention and we said, okay, let's actually have a phone and a server script check the proximity to each other by generating sound and by recording ambient sound. And this is natively supported. I mean, you're, if you enable this feature, for example, for, this can be enabled per domain, right? So when you log into a domain, it will ask you once, do you want to enable this? You can make it permanent or you can do it per session, whatever you want, but essentially you enable every time Google, when you, when you go to, the, to, to its page, and if you enable this, you enable them to record any sound that, that is in the environment, right? It's a little bit spooky, but, but people seem to like it. I don't know. So the basic idea is really, you enter your username and password, you transmit and record some sound, uh, you do some comparison, right? I mean, again, not important, some feature matching and so on. You, you do some similarity score, some machine learning and AI fancy stuff as always, and then you send the login authorization to a, to a server, right? So you communicate to check proximity and you record ambient noise to check proximity. So this is just a demo, you know, one of my students is logging in and just as a and then when he signs in you know the no interaction is required the nice thing is that this works actually if your phone is in your pocket if it's in the in the bag essentially in the room of course you could say well what if someone else is in the room yeah sure you know he, then he needs to know, know your username and password plus be in the room with you with that, with that device. So that's our, that's our attacker model. We don't want, I mean, this is what we assume, right? We are talking about remote attacks, right? Not someone who is following you, right? Which I think in any case, it's a really, really strong attacker. So yeah, so that's pretty much it. So I, I really like this. Uh, if you're interested in soundproof, it's, uh, it's, it's there as well. Uh, the guys are pushing on with it. I think it's a really cool project. Uh, we're actually testing it with 500 users uh, currently, and uh, and it's probably one of the largest usability studies that I've seen. And I've never seen someone so serious about about uh, user studies in an academic environment. So I, I really, and it's not me; it's my students. I really appreciate what they're doing. So obviously, um, acknowledgments in random order, because as I said, uh, this is a lot of work and I definitely didn't do all, all of this myself. There are a lot of people who now moved on to academic positions, industry, started startups and so on that are working on these projects. And, um, and I, I absolutely have to acknowledge them. Obviously, there are a bunch of publications related to this and uh, I always have to uh, 
thank uh, ETH for providing uh, me and, and these guys a, a wonderful environment for this research. So, and thank you for uh, coming to the talk. We have time for questions. Um. So it was either a terrible talk or such an amazing talk that no one wants to ask questions. So uh, one question, does the, um, whether the distance is large or small, does, does the influence it like uh, things that the science of comparing um, a distance measures in, in a room or a couple of buildings towards satellite, which is so much longer? So our, our distance measurement system, uh, so currently, so the numbers that I've shown are a little bit even old, so they, they, they claim a range of 150 meters. Uh, the recent prototype should go up to 250 meters. Uh, obviously, all of the numbers that I show here are line of sight, I think, because even I have to state this, because in a non-line of sight environment, you, it depends on the environment. So you have to always, you can never show, I mean, we have tests in different environments, but it's, um, you know, currently our system, let me give you um, maybe one example, is built in such a way so that it goes through a human. So if your key is in, the, in your back pocket, it can penetrate a human, right? It can go somehow to, a, to the car. So if you're, that kind of uh, communication is feasible. Now, the, um, of course, you can always increase the power if you, want, if you want more of it. But these systems have to be designed such that they have a certain, certain power within a certain spectrum. So you cannot arbitrarily increase the power because otherwise you will essentially jam everyone else. So you're not allowed according to all kinds of US, European, and essentially global standards to, to, to use arbitrary power, especially in ultra-wideband systems uh, which cover wide, wide ranges, right? so of uh, you know, wide spectrums. Okay, uh, I have uh, another question. Currently we have uh, GPS, GLONASS, and uh, Galileo, and we are about to have this Chinese and Indian uh, satellite uh, networks. Uh, and uh, for sure, soon uh, every device will have a multimodal receiver. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it any safer? For example, the three-mode three, three mode receiver will, uh, sure. will vote that uh, if you spoof only the GPS signal, sure. uh, to, to, to Romanic will will outvote the so spoofed one. So so the um, so other satellite systems they operate in the same, in a let's say, almost the same way. Now Galileo um, has is trying to push essentially secret spreading codes into the civilian domain, so allowing some sort of selective access to particular keys uh, that are used to spread signals, right? So you need a symmetric key shared with the receiver, in, and then you spread the signal with that key, and then the receiver can be spread. And this is done essentially to provide uh, additional resilience to spoofing, because you, if you can't find the signal, you can't shift it, right? So this would be the argument. Um, however, the... Um, it's not really clear, so the complexity of this deployment seems to be very high currently because you, you, um, you know, who gives you this key? So this key needs to be given to you and currently, as far as I understood, um, I've been looking into this a little bit, it will trickle down some national authorities and then potentially local law enforcement and then you would get a key and then you, you would be able to use it. So maybe if you are a transport company, you would somehow get access, but I've heard that there the ideas are potentially that you would record your samples on your GPS receiver, send them into the cloud, and then they would return back a location to you, right? So that would be the kind of ideas that they're playing with. So it might be somewhat increased robustness with a caveat, and my caveat is always that you are essentially assuming when you spread the signals that no one can find them, right? And the reason why no one can find them is that they are below a noise level. Right? and that there is always noise and that no one is able to dig these signals out of the noise. Right? So the, and I, you know, let me give you a, a simple example. What if I point a satellite dish into the sky, right, into the satellites and try to, 
try to get these signals to be stronger, essentially increase, increasing the gain of the, of, um, to, to obtain the signals from the satellites. And in that case, I will potentially reduce noise, increase the signal, and potentially can get these, these out, right? So, of course, it seems like a, you know, a crazy type of an attack, but I've been, I, I don't want to say more, but let's say that we're hoping that it can work. Yeah. Um. You mentioned that some of the technology is going to be used in cars and yeah. other things. Can you talk about power consumption for these sure. devices? How often you have to change batteries? Sure. So, um, so you can. I mean, I'm actually super happy to talk about that because the um, that's one of the uh, one of the main challenges for which I actually the solution of that I can absolutely take zero uh, zero credit. So. Um, we had to we had to work there with people who are specialized uh, who are specialists in uh, in ultra wide and low power radio design, right? And and these are your uh, these are the numbers. So essentially, the the power consumption of these devices is is roughly the same as uh, low power or Bluetooth low en low energy, right? So this means in a in a in a scenario of um, of a car key, so we could we can do. 30 million measurements on a coin battery, because this this uh, key fob needs to last for four four years roughly, and uh, and you can essentially on a coin battery you can that that's how how long it can last maybe a bit a bit a bit more. So doing these systems to be with high power actually might not even be such a I mean can be done let's say, but doing it at such a low power and uh, in the end building a chip that wouldn't that would <laughs> that would work. Is uh, quite uh, is is quite a challenge and was quite a challenge. Yeah. I have something um, also a question that adds to the low power thing. Uh, since it is such low power, um, is it still vulnerable then to jammers also? Because the signal strength is quite low, and if I jam the whole channel, then sure, you can always jam these systems. I mean, this is not uh, uh, pretty much. There is no there's no help there, right? You. I would say, essentially, jamming is a sort of a power game, right? I mean, of course, you can use spreading to do a little bit more, but but in the end, jamming is a is a game of forcing the adversary to transmit at such a high power so that he would become detectable, right? And that you can pinpoint his location and take him out with different means, <laughs> typically physical means, right? So because you you can't. Um, you can't do that, and and here you're you're limited by by regulations, right? You cannot transmit at a higher power than you are, and um, and jamming here wouldn't really achieve much because it would just be a DOS. You wouldn't be able to enter your car, so fine. You know, it wouldn't really matter, right? I mean, the the system works in a way that when you approach a car, it will unlock. If there is no communication, it doesn't unlock. When you move away from the car, when it sees that there is no more communication, it can just lock it, itself up, right? For example, but there are different models of cars, and they handle this differently, right? Some of them require you to put a hand onto the onto the lock, which is essentially just uh, to somehow activate the whole process, right? But it, it's not really a security measure; it's more, uh, you know, let's say, a convenience measure. Uh, there is also a lot of a lot of the psychology of the users, right? I mean, the users somehow prefer to have a feeling that they have actually done something for a system to unlock. Right? They, they 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 want to be able to do something because then then they feel like the system is more secure because they grab the handle, right? but it does nothing, right? Anyone else can grab the handle, right? There's no fingerprint sensor there or anything of that sort, right? So it uh, doesn't really matter. Yeah. It makes people feel good, which I guess it's it does something. Yeah. Having been interested in infrastructureless device-to-device -device authentication for a couple of years, I've I've asked Serge, and again, so I guess there's a question somewhere between Serge and Nick. Uh, what would it take for us to get this in Android devices for them to authenticate among each other? Hey, how, how far are we away from that? Hey, when can we start? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I mean, of course, uh, you know, having these kind of things deployed in uh, in phones or and and so on would be would be simply fantastic, you know, for uh, in general. But um, but it's more a a decision for companies to say, "Hey, this is something that we can use." We have been talking to some to some companies to um, uh, that manufacture phones, and so we are hoping that 
something might happen. I, I'm kind of convinced that, that maybe not in, if not in the next five years, but in the next 10 years, there will be an ultra wideband distance measurement technology in the phones. Is it going to be exactly this kind of a, this kind of a system or slightly different? I don't know, but I'm convinced that one will be there, not only for security, but for many other applications. So, hey, this is something that we put out, out there. If someone is interested, we are super happy to deploy it, right? So that's uh, a, bo a bottom line. We are actually working on, you know, Mac layers for this and all kinds of other, other things. And um, in this play of standardization and uh, companies pushing for deployment and, uh, you know, things emerging through different channels, it's hard to predict how much uh, one can influence. The only thing that I can do is give these kind of talks and try to <laughs> get people excited about it. Yeah. But thanks for the question. I think it's, it's great. Thanks, and I think it was also a great last question. Thanks again for your presentation. Let's Thank go you. for a coffee break.